Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Divorced Woman's Guide podcast. I am so happy that you have tuned into today's episode because I am here with my friend, Tanya. Hello, Tanya. How are you? Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Tanya is here to talk with us today about something that I think we all do a very poor job at, and that is in goal setting, (laughs) that it doesn't seem to work for too many of us. So um, Tanya is here and she's going to help us to actually start creating a lifestyle of transformation and how we can start putting together better habits that actually stick. So before we dive in, let me share a little bit more with you, with our audience today about you. So Tanya Shaw is a sought after life and weight loss coach. She is also the host of the Fit and Vibrant You podcast. She is the founder of Ascend Fitness and Lifestyle, which is a holistic health coaching studio in Chilliwack, British Columbia, and Fit and Vibrant Over 50. Tanya has built a credible reputation for helping thousands of women get to their happy, healthy weight permanently, naturally, and without the obsession so that they can live their life. Tanya and her husband, Keith, as well as their son, Jacob, live in Chilliwack, British Columbia, which is about an hour outside of Vancouver, Canada. She loves being active outdoors, such as running, hiking, paddle boarding, mountain biking, and camping and a woman after my own heart. She also loves a good cup of coffee and a glass of red wine, which I hope we will get to share one day together. (laughs) So thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you because so many of us struggle with creating new habits around goals that we set. And clearly, you know a lot about this topic. So before we dive in, I would love for you to just share a little bit more about what led you to do the work that you're doing today and why it's so important to you. Thank you. So my mission, my purpose is really to help other people, other women to truly feel good in their bodies so that they can go live their life because that's what it's all about. And the work I do is primarily about making peace with food, with our body, so we can spend, or we can spend that mental real estate, our thought energy on living our life, on, on engaging our life, instead of being stuck in the cycle of being all in and all on and you know, falling off track and giving up with yourself and being disappointing, disappointing yourself and being stuck in that yo-yo diet cycle, that cycle of body hate, self-hate. And for myself, I fell in love with fitness actually at quite a young age. I, it was my vehicle for building relationships. It what made me feel so great. And I really, I loved it. And I also loved science and all that kind of good stuff too. And realized that there was a degree called kinesiology where I could actually study the science of human movement. And that's how I got into um, more like professionally what I'm doing right now. But along the way, when I was about 21, I actually started my very first official diet. And that might be old for, for some of your listeners. And a lot of the women I work with, they start when they were five or seven or eight years old. But that for me was the first time that I really recognized that I could control the food that I put in my body and I could transform the way my body looked. And for some people, they go on their first diet and they fail and they, you know, they gain all the way back. For me, it was a little bit different. So I had, I I started to develop this more obsession with food and controlling every single thing I put in my my mouth. I let the number on the scale dictate my self-worth, whether or not I could enjoy my day or my date with my husband. And it really just stopped me from truly living my life. And I felt good when I was losing weight and I loved the compliments and I felt, you know, in control and in charge, but it stopped me from truly living. And I remember one day when I was with my son and I just all of a sudden had this moment that I would look back at my life and regret that I wasted on all of these small living moments because I was stuck in my head worrying about whether that food is going to make me fat or whether I can control it. And I, and at the same time, when you go into that restriction, you go from restriction to being like, you know, to controlling every morsel of food that you eat to being, you know, cheating on your diet and doing the cycle over and over again. 
And it's just really no way to live. And at the same time, I was coaching clients to help them lose weight and they would, but then they would gain it back again. And I just realized that there's so much more to this whole lifestyle than you know, the food and the exercise. And there had to be a, a, another option between you know, being super quote unquote good and being all in and then falling off track and saying like, oh, what the, you know, what the heck, I'm gonna drink all the wine and eat all the cakes because life's too short. There had to be that third option. And I really did, that's what I, that's what I do now. That, that third option between hating yourself, loving yourself and eating whatever you want. It's, um, you know, it's really about, really ultimately about living your life and finding a better way that diets and the diet industry, they don't teach you. No, they don't. Because I feel like so much of, of how we see ourselves is based on a number on the scale. You know, I hate scales personally. I, they really just, to me, they don't represent how I feel. They don't represent, you know, how, you know, I'm a runner. I eat healthy. I indulge. Yes. I like a glass of wine every now and then I've recently discovered bourbon. Like I like to indulge. And, you know, one of the things that you said earlier that I would love for you to express more because you know, I think that it's, it's a concept that so many of us try to wrap our minds around, but that's what you had said before, which was like, you finally made peace with food. So what does that mean? What does that even look like? And how does that set you up for success in sort of, you know, transforming the way or your relationship with food in your body? I think a big part is that when we're always fighting food, fighting ourselves, we're going to lose. Like we're just always being And I think there's this concept that we need to like do things hard. We need to be like always restrictive in order to, to get results. And at the end of the day, we just keep fighting ourselves. And like I said, then, then you lose restriction also, or piece of food also, there's a lot of moralities that we hold about food, what what foods are good, what foods are bad. And then when, when we eat the foods that are bad, we usually punish ourselves and we punish ourselves by either over restricting and logging the extra miles on the treadmill or the run the next day, not because you want to feel good and love the way that you move, but because you need to burn those calories and because it's, it's punishment. Or you, we have this black or white perfectionist way of thinking that if we're not gonna do things perfectly because we actually believe that we can and that there's a standard out there that is possible, but it's not, when we fail to meet that imaginary standard that doesn't exist, then we punish ourselves by going all, like we eat all the foods and we overindulge because what's the point? And it's really about breaking that, like those big, like that, that, uh, that, that like the rocky relationship with food where you're going like really, 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 you know, with the peaks and the, and the big lows and they are, they're still ups and downs, but it's more just like little rolling hills now and not like the big mountains anymore. Right. And when you stop fighting food all the time, when you stop fighting yourself all the time, when you start to listen to yourself, you start to nourish your own body, it frees up a lot of your thought energy, your life energy. So you can do things that ha- matter more. So you're not always thinking about all the time. It takes a, that's what women tell me that they're, it's exhausting because food, their weight, their diet is always on their mind. And it's really no way to live. You know, I work with women specifically over 50. And they tell me, you know, by the time they're in their 60s, 70s, they thought they would have figured it out by now. They thought that, you know, when they started dieting when they were 15, uh, 17 years old, that by the time they're 60s, they would, they, they'd get it, but they, but they don't. Yeah. Well, and for those of us that are going through divorce, you know, there's, there's a very interesting relationship that we have with food, right? Many of us sort of either, you know, we eat our emotions or we starve our emotions, right? And so really finding that right place because it's so important that we nourish our bodies, that we nourish ourselves with good food. But so many of us, when we are presented with the choice of like a bag of chips and an apple, you know, for some reason, the chips feels more satisfying than the apple does. So what are some, what are some, I don't know if it's like ways that you can talk yourself into the apple or what are some ways that people can start thinking about, you know, like yesterday I decided to have an apple with peanut butter, like as a little after almond butter, really, um, as like an afternoon snack. Cause I was like, Oh, fiber and protein. And that'll like fuel me for the rest of the day. 
and I also could have chosen the chips that were in the pantry, but I was like, no, I'm going to be good, but it's hard. It's so hard mentally to, to get yourself to a place where, you know, you have, you have to eat, <laughs> you know, but to, to reach for the healthier of the, of your options. Great question. And I love when you were saying there, it's just about the mindset piece and how yeah. mentally it can be more challenging, but it really should not require a lot of willpower. Like sometimes we think that we need more willpower. We need to really like white knuckle it. We need to restrict it. We need to like push things really hard. And there is actually another way, but I'm going to take a step back here. And a big part of this process is getting really clear on what you actually want, because quite often what we happen, what happens, we start, um, you know, life, a life change happens. You want to all of a sudden start losing weight or you have a aha moment and you see a picture of yourself and you're like, Hey, I'm going to get, I'm going to lose weight and get in shape. And that's your motivating factor. You want to lose the weight. And it's not enough to actually keep us going forward. Or you have that aha moment, usually it's something negative that is going to spur you to take action, like for your listeners. And maybe it was the, the divorce where you're like, all of a sudden now I need to start taking care of myself. Or it was, again, that number on the scale that you saw if you're weighing yourself or the clothes don't fit you anymore. Your doctor tells you that you're borderline type 2 diabetic. And then we spur on by doing um, all the things to take care of ourselves. But then the motivation to, to keep going, it's, it's motivation to get away from something that we don't want instead of, some, instead of moving towards something that we do want. And eventually, after you make a couple of better choices or you start walking or running a little bit or make some improve your eating habits, that, motivate, that, that thing that you want to get away from, whether it is the number on the scale that you never want to see or your clothes not fitting you or that scare from your doctor, that motivating factor, that, that thing that you don't want, it is going to subside a little bit. And unless we keep painting that picture, unless we keep focusing on where we're going and what we do want and how great it feels when you nourish your body well, on how much energy that you're going to have when you make the better choices. On one thing that we don't articulate very often, we don't talk about is being in being congruent, being in alignment with the woman that you want to be. If you're always thinking that you want to be a healthy, fit, vibrant woman, but you're constantly going to the chips and following and, and uh, not following following through on promises to yourself, then you are out of alignment with the person that you want to be. And that feels pretty terrible. I mean, we don't have trust for ourselves. We don't like ourselves. So for one thing, at the very beginning, it's, it's important to know I, mean, I shouldn't say you need to know where you where you want to go because sometimes when you get started, you may not know that yet, but you might know you might not you might know what you don't want. You might know that you don't want to be where you're at. But as you go through this process, you want to keep painting the picture of where you're going, of the future, like the, the future picture, and that's a really big important key to keep that motivation going. And then now that we have a bigger purpose behind it because ultimately if it's just about the number on the scale you can justify to in the moment that um well if i eat the chips right now then i'll you know do something tomorrow to make up for it or something like that but but it matters because now you might have planned for that apple and peanut butter to eat healthy but if you don't do that you're breaking a promise to yourself and that matters you know, so often we wonder as women why we don't like ourselves, why we, well, why our self-talk is so negative, and it's because we're eight or mean to ourselves quite often, and we don't follow through on promises to ourselves. We don't trust ourselves, and like you said on, on, on when you came on the Fit and Vibrant Be podcast too, if you had a friend that was always like making promises to meet you for, you know, an outing, and that person's always not following through, you're gonna stop hanging out with that person, and that's what we do. So number one is to really get clear on the greater purpose behind what you're doing and keep that front of mind. So to, like remembering your goals, you're getting excited about where you're going, why you're doing this every single day. So we actually have some motivation. We have some drive. We always ask yourself, how do I get more motivation? Well, motivation is not a passive process. You don't sit down and just wait for motivation to fall from the sky. It doesn't happen that way. I wish it did. But that would a, be great. <laughs> it's an active process of creating. Yeah. And then the next thing is when it comes to actually, this is why diets don't work is because they don't actually take you from where you are to making small improvements. 
is to be realistic as to what's an improvement for you when you are creating habits. Because a lot of women I work with, most women I work with have this perfectionist type mentality or this black or white thinking. And they believe that because they saw that number on the scale or something really uncomfortable happened to them or their clothes no longer fit, that that's going to be enough to make all of these changes all at once. And the reality is not. And then we don't get, get there and we feel like a failure. We feel like we lack willpower and we go back to the beginning. So um, I know this is a long <laughs> answer to your no, question. No, it's great. But first, um, getting clear on what you want, remembering why you want it, setting your, like, and then creating those small, simple action steps that are going to be an improvement for you. From where you are now to where you want to, where, where you want to be, think about what can I actually do that's realistic, that's doable, that's sustainable, that with a nine out of 10 confidence rating, I know I can do it today and make that for your daily actionable goal today. It's really important to have like the long-term idea of where you want to go, but then each and every day, what am I actually doing to move myself forward? And then when it comes to things like the apple and the peanut butter, a great question to ask is how can I make like making healthy choices easier on myself? How can I make it simpler? How can I set myself up for success? I mean, sometimes it's environment. It's not everyone has full control over the foods that's in their house, but if you have apples in your fridge that are ready to go, and when you're hungry, you open the fridge and it's there, you're going to be more likely to actually have it versus the chips and everything like that. Well, and I would also imagine, I have so many questions um, and comments, like I have so much going through my head right now, but I, you know, I think so many times too, we forget that it's a combination of the food that we put in our bodies. And it's also the physical activity that it really is. And especially as we get older, our metabolism slows down. I mean, Lord knows my metabolism is nowhere near what it used to be. And I have to be really careful. I work out a lot. How do you find the right mix of exercise and nutrition and fitting it into your schedule and, you know, carving out room to, to do both? Yeah. Great question. So first of all, I think it's really important that we look at it as an investment and not as time taken away because we often think that, oh, because I, you know, I have a full schedule and I don't have the time to like it. Cause when you take care of yourself, it's actually going to help you in all aspects of your life. And that's a really important thing to like really internalize and to practice that they, the investment for planning your meals or cutting up vegetables or fitting in a small workout, that's going to pay off, uh, it's going to pay off huge. When I work with my women, because my women come mostly from the diet cycle and that's what we really work on, we do focus on, I mean, there's lots of areas that we can tackle, um, tackle at the beginning, but we start to really focus on the relationship of food piece first and movement is actually one of our key and habits that we work on, but it's more of, it's a little bit later down the road and it's not necessarily the most important thing that we need to do right off the bat when we're working on like, you know, the big picture of overcoming the diet cycle and, and overcoming the relationship with food. Um, in order to actually get it done though, like in terms of strategies, one is to really break the ties between exercise and weight loss. And just think like, no, I'm doing this because I want to have energy. I mean, today I have a, I had a full day of calls and I knew I want to be on my A game. So I got my, my butt out the door and I went for a run because I know I'm going to have more energy and I'm going to feel better because of it. So that's really important to, to have that and to make things once again, like as simple and easy as possible. So things like, and, and what gets in the way are, are usually black and white thinking like, I, you know, that half an hour, I don't have time for the half an hour walk. So I'm not going to do it at all, but you know what? The five minutes of stretching that you're going to do is better than the half hour, 45 minute walk that you don't do. We have like, we need to adopt this all or something mentality and ask ourselves within the parameters of my day, within the parameters of what things look like, what can I do to take care of myself? And when you ask that kind of question and not what can I do is in like, oh, I'm going to throw my hands up and be the victim. Like, what can I do? I can't do anything. It's out of my control. But you ask yourself, maybe you have a really full day. Maybe you have a child who's sick at home. Maybe I don't know what's going on in your day, but then you can ask yourself, what can I do today 
so that I can end the day and I feel proud, I feel content, I feel like I've taken good care of myself. What does that look like for today? Yeah, and I, and I think you bring up such a really great point, and especially those of you listening, you know, who are in divorce, outside of divorce, you know, one of the things that I recognize is like the days that I have my boys, I, I get like my bare bone minimum workout in. And the days that I don't have my boys, I'm actually able to do more because I'm not having to, you know, wake up, make breakfast. One of my sons is back in school. Like, so it's also, I think, coming to peace with the type of schedule that works for you. You know, I remember, you know, when first thinking about meditating, I thought meditating had to look a certain way and it doesn't. And and that's kind of what I'm hearing you trying to get that point across to the audience today, which is that, you know, just because nutrition and health looks one way to somebody, it doesn't mean that that definition is going to necessarily work for you. And what's more important is for you to set an intention behind the goals that you are setting for yourself and let that be the motivation instead of, let's say a duration or, you know, I know my biggest weakness is like food portion. Like I have portion issues, like not, I mean, I'm a petite five, three woman and I love food. And I know that for me, you know, portion is something that I get to work on having a relationship with. And again, it's not a matter of looking at what other people are doing, but really finding what works best for me and just being okay with it. Oh, I love that you said that, you know, a great question to ask yourself sometimes is says who, because (laughs) I love that. Made up beliefs, these made up stories. Like it doesn't count. I had a conversation with one of um, my coaches yesterday, and she's like, "I because I was recommending a book on Audible, and I can't find it on Amazon right now." So she's like, "I haven't listened to Audible." I'm like, "Why?" She's like, "Because she has this belief or the story that it doesn't count." I'm like, "Says who? Says who doesn't count?" Um, meditation, like you're right, same thing. Like, who says that you need to meditate for 20 minutes or 10 minutes or or whatever so that it counts? Like, on whose yeah. standards, like whose made up standards are you comparing yourself to? Um, the other thing I think that's really helpful um, for goal setting and for being consistent, um, and I learned this from one of my clients, one of my past clients. She calls them TMX goals. So T is your target, and I was like, ideally, this is what to get done. M is the minimum, like this is the baseline. Maybe it, if, if it's meditation, it's a 30 seconds of breathing, but it's like, no matter what, you know, you can get that done. I also like thinking of it as like your toothbrush level and that's brushing your teeth is your bare minimum of self hygiene every day. And that's like the, the bare minimum of your habit. And then you have the extreme, the X is, you know, when, thing, when I'm crushing it, when I have more time, when things are great, here's what I love to get to. But that range can be really helpful so that we actually stay consistent with our habits versus only doing them when life is perfect, because you know what, that probably will never happen. No, no. And I even just recorded a podcast episode all about sort of morning routine and, and how like my morning routine, the theme of it is the same every morning. Sometimes it looks a little bit different. Um, you know, durations look a little bit different every day, but it's about consistency. And I think that that is the key piece to how you are able to create new habits. You know, I've always said and have heard, although who knows, maybe it's changed recently that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. I don't know if that still rings true or not, but for those listeners uh, today, you know, who are tuning in, what are some ways for them to start stepping into creating new habits and really transforming their relationship with their bodies, their minds and food? Great question. And I love, by the way, that you're talking about morning routines, because Mm -hmm. when the first things that we do in our program, Fit Environment Over 50, is we actually develop really great morning and evening rituals and morning and evening routines, because they are like, they are the anchor points of your day. And because each day to day, like our daily life is going to be different. So whether you have your kids at home or the way you're working or it's a Saturday or on vacation, but that's the one part of your day that you can always be consistent. So the first question is back to the question that we asked is how to actually start creating habits and how to create that transformation. It's great to know, uh, like sort of to do a little bit of a brainstorm as to what you could do. So if you were, let's say you have a goal, if I was confident, I felt great in my body, I was taking great care of myself. What does that person do? 
well, how does she show up? How does she live her day? And we say this not to say that you're going to make a big list and do all of it because I don't want you to do that. But it's good, nice to get an idea of like what's the first step forward. It's good to know where you're going. You don't need to know all of the steps that you're going to take to get there. But when you have that list, like, like the ideas of like what, you know, what are the possibilities, it gives you something that you just a little bit of a launching point to take that next step forward. Then the next step is to choose like honestly one thing that you know that you can implement and think, can I do this realistically for the rest of my life? So if you're like, hey, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna eat any carbs, I'm not gonna eat, drink any wine, and you're like, but I love carbs, but I love wine, and you're only doing it because you wanna get the weight off uh, for a short period of time, it's, don't do it, don't do it. I know it's sexy to say you're gonna like lose 10 pounds this month, but it sucks when you gain 50 in the next, the next month. Like it's so much better to play the long game and to build consistency over intensity. So pick that one thing that you're going to do, that simple, doable action item that you can do. Um, when, with my women, we have that morning routine and in one of the practices, we have a three-step morning routine. And one of them is to create our plan for the day, is to create like, what are my simple, doable action steps for today? I like to keep them to like three, unless they're really simple and really doable that they can have more that I'm going to do to move myself forward. Like what does winning look like for today? And then when you have clarity on that, the like clarity is really important. Sometimes we just sort of go at it. We're like, hey, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm like, what does that mean? Does mm-hmm. it mean that you're going to have more vegetables or you're going to have like this many servings of vegetables? We have these really ambiguous um, targets. Mm-hmm. Um, like being ambiguous is great for long-term inspiration. So that, to say like, I want to be fit and vibrant and healthy. Like there's no measuring stick for that. No. But on a day-to-day basis, get specific. Get really clear on what success looks like for you. And then make sure it's doable. You might learn after a couple of attempts what's doable and what's not. And then how can you make it easier for yourself? How can you make that habit easier? How can you make it uh, simpler? How can you make it more fun to do? And the biggest thing that you're going to probably need to work on, this is 95, I know you, when do you do this too with your, your woman, is changing the way that you think. Because the, the way that we make things hard on ourselves is we try to negotiate with ourselves, we argue with ourselves, we argue for our limitations, we talk ourselves out of the habits that we want to do, and it's all about how we talk ourselves, talk to ourselves, and that's how you get started. Um, those are, that's more for like the actual tangible habits when it comes to things like body love, body acceptance. Um, I actually did a podcast on that a little while ago. Um, I think it's called Body Appreciation and Tanya Shaw, you could probably find it, but um, that's also a practice that's going to be paying attention to or the way that we think about ourselves. That's going to be challenging those thoughts. That's going to be um, doing even things sometimes like cleansing your social media and looking at the environment and, and, and what you're actually you know, bringing into your world as well. Yeah. I love that cleansing social media. I'm all about cleansing social media. It's so important for mental health, um, which a lot of this has to do with. And I love that how you said like, this is, it's a long game, right? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's the same thing. You know, I I preach the same thing when it comes to divorce recovery is that it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, you know, like you said, you can definitely, you know, go for the five pounds in one week. And then what's going to happen to you the next week? You're probably, I don't know about you, but for me, when I go on inconsistent, you know, highs and lows like that. I tend to binge the next week because I'm like, Oh my God, food. I miss food. I miss this. I miss that. (laughs) You know, instead of, I agree with you, it's really about consistency. It's about, um, you know, and I'm also a believer in like, you get to indulge again, portion control, but you get to indulge, right? Like I find that when I starve myself of wanting things that I then, I'm like my own worst enemy in those circumstances, right? I'm sure you see that very often. Absolutely. It's like uh, when there's a perceived restriction, whether it is on, you're on a diet, or even if you are now trying to ditch the diet, but you have these moralities around foods, like, oh, that food's bad for me, that food's good for me. We have uh, like this hardware mechanism to survive. And thank goodness we have it. I mean, it's this why our species has survived. But when there's restriction, your body, your mind is going to want to, it's going to go into primal mode. It's going to want to hoard things. It's going to want to, what happened when COVID-19 hit with the whole toilet paper thing? 
Yes. Movie restriction and we're like, well, let's just take all of it because we feel like there's a perceived lack. And same thing with food. Like when you perceive that food is going to be off limits, when you are feeling like, and and it's not like you're not choosing them just not to have it because you, you know, you're, it's not a choice, but you're like, I, I feel like I can't have it. Or even if, like I said, even if it's not a diet, even if it's just you telling yourself, but feeling like you're depriving yourself or you're being restricting, then yeah, that's the tendency. And so the great thing that we, what I uh, coach my clients to do is actually to we create plans for our like parameters, guidelines for our eating styles. And it's going to change over time. You know, if you're going to, if you're eating to start with uh, like a huge carton of ice cream and you're eating cereal from the box, like just by the handful, then you might not go to like kale and beans right away, but you might make a little step in the right direction, but actually planning and having parameters of how you want to in guidelines for how you want to enjoy those foods so that's not cheating because you created the plan it's on your plan and that makes a huge difference and yeah it takes a lot away a lot of that that guilt and like oh i shouldn't have that because it's it's i mean it's food is food food is food yeah it's not good it's not bad it's just food and some foods are a little bit healthier than others So what would you say today, um, you know, if you could leave one piece of advice with our audience today about how it is that they can take a step forward in their own transformation, or even perhaps it's their relationship to food, it's mindset driven, what would you, what would you, what would you tell that one listener today? I was like, I got like 40 things that I want to tell. I know. <laughs> well, share, share a couple then. I don't want to limit you. No, it's so, so much. So I think one thing is to be honest with yourself, like to be honest with yourself, you have, if you have done the diets before, I know how tempting it is to want to go and do that next thing because we believe that this time is going to be different, but just really be honest with yourself and get focused on what you really want, because what you want is not to be you know, held down by some diet plan and counting points or calories for the rest of your life and tracking everything you eat in my fitness pal. Like you want to live your life. When we get really clear on what we actually want, not just like little distractions in the way or the little shiny objects, like keep focusing on that and put your blinders on for everything else. Because I mean, it doesn't matter what time of year, there's so much crap out there that's going to tell you that this is the next best thing and just do this. And it's going to, you know, hack your metabolism and and, and you know what, you've done that. I've done that. We've all done that. And, and here we are looking like for the long-term solution and having that permanent weight loss. You need, like you said, we need to be in it for the long game. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. I mean, there is no arriving. It's something that we're going to be working on. We're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful journey to be on. So be kind with yourself, be compassionate, but be honest with yourself and tell the truth. Yeah, I think that's so incredibly important. And, you know, I'm a huge proponent of compassion and grace because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, that we are, we are our own worst friend, we are our own worst critic, and we don't provide ourselves with enough compassion and grace. And I think that, you know, those of us who stop the comparison game sooner rather than later, you'll start getting yourself on a path that works for you because, you know, your journey, your path looks different from everybody else's. Your body is different. Your mindset is different. And you can always ask for help, right? You can always ask for support. So um, I know that you have an amazing community. I'd love for you to share with our audience today how they can get in touch with you and, and, you know, if they're looking for more resources and for that support, please share with our audience. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy. So if you listen to podcasts and you do, since you're listening to this right now, (laughs) I have a podcast called The Fit and Vibrant You. It's um, been doing it since 2015, have lots of episodes there on all sorts of topics related to health, wellness, body love, body acceptance, relationship with food. Um, I also have a free Facebook group called the Fit and Vibrant Women Community. To join that, go to tanyashaw.com forward slash join, and that will redirect you to the community. And then if you're wishing to learn more to the three steps that I work with my women on to ditch that diet cycle, to get to their happy, healthy body weight, and then you can go to fit vibrant 50. That is the number 50.com. And I have a mini training for you there. 
Amazing. This was such great information. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your wisdom with everybody who tuned in. I just, I adore you. And I love that the work that you do is, it, it is so easy for all of us to start on our journey. It doesn't have to be hard the way we think it ought to be. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Wendy. Of course. And everybody tuning in. Oh my goodness. I hope you guys took notes. I hope that you wrote down some really great nuggets of information because I can tell you that I sure learned a lot. And, and to be honest, it never hurts to hear it again, uh, mm -hmm. to reinforce these messages inside of ourselves so that we can all start on to our path to feel our best and to become and live. Well, it's really to become our best selves and to live our best life because you get to do that at any given point in your life. It's never too late. So thank you all for tuning into today's episode. As always, sending you tons of love, light, and joy. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.